Welcome to this week's episode of Talk of the Town. My name is Philip Swiskett, and I am back with my good friend and co-host, Dr. Kenneth Harper from Vein Specialist of the South. If you have questions about your veins, give my friends at Vein Specialist of the South a call, and they will get you the answers that you deserve. We're sitting here today in the Georgia Sports Hall of Fame. And we're about to hear one of the most fascinating stories that you've ever heard about Middle Georgia. Joining us today is Jack Golson, who is producing a documentary that we really want to, to share with you and explain the details of. Jack, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, and it feels good to be in making my hometown. Right. Yeah, we've, we've been talking for over two years about this interview right? and about the project uh, More Than Champions, the documentary. Uh, for folks, our viewers, some uh, may not tell us a little bit about yourself, about uh, your relationship uh, in Macon, your dad, and and then we'll, we'll go into something about the documentary. Sure. Well, Macon's my hometown, born and raised here. My dad was the superintendent of schools the entire time I was in school. So from first grade to graduation, he was a superintendent and he uh, brought in desegregation. He was uh, in charge of desegregating all of the schools, which went well in Bibb right. County, went real well. So there's that legacy, and this uh, More Than Champions ties into that a little bit, I think, doesn't it? Sure. So sure. tell us a little bit about the, the three or four storylines that are kind of meshed together yeah. that we're talking about today. Yeah, More, More Than Champions uh, is about really two different worlds that come together during the Civil Rights era through basketball, simply through basketball. It uh, includes a, um, a small uh, basketball school or basketball team from a small, predominantly uh, white high school, Mark Smith High School, that won the state championship in 1969 in the large school classification. It also includes a basketball team from an African American high school, Beach of Savannah, that made history by winning the first integrated state basketball tournament in 1967. Beach had a player by the name of of uh, Gator Rivers that was super talented. Gator ultimately became the best ball handler in the world and joined the Hall and Globetrotters. And Gator was gonna join me today, but Gator had a, a medical emergency and I'm wishing him well for recovery. Uh, also, Sam Oney is, in par is part of this uh, documentary. Sam is the first African-American student to attend Mercer in 1963 and the story it includes the challenges that Sam faced moving from Africa to America to get an education during the Civil Rights era. Okay, so fascinating, those three stories intertwined. We look forward to learning more about it in our interview today, and this show is going to be really good. Good. So I understand there was someone by the name of Coach Clifton that's very key to this, to this story that we're talking about here. Talk to us about how he motivated you during this time. Sure. Coach Clifton... He was a star at Mercer, played basketball at Mercer. He's in the Hall of Fame there. And he was in his mid-20s when he took over our team. And he was very, very um, uh, creative. He knew that in a couple of years, we were going to be playing these, these very talented African-American teams. And so he said, well, the best way to acclimate y'all is you need to play with them. So Washington Park used to have an outdoor basketball court mm -hmm. and some of the best players and making African-American players played them at Washington Park. So he started taking us, dropping us off at the park. We started playing with these, these guys. And uh, that was one of the things that helped us realize what we needed to do to improve our game. Jack, if you don't mind, set the tone for us about the overall racial tone in this area at that time. I, I imagine there's a lot of people, probably my age and younger, who you know just simply don't know what was going on at the time. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing really because you did have, um, you did have segregation, pretty, pretty strict segregation. And one of the things Coach Clifton wanted us to do is also go down to the city auditorium. That's where all the big basketball games were played. And the two African-American high schools, Ballard Hudson, Peter G. Applin, were playing one evening. And he wanted to take us, he did. We went up to the city auditorium, we got to the door and we were told no whites allowed. Well, Coach Clifton kept going and finally talked the, uh, the doorman into letting us go in. And he, he led us all the way down the, the auditorium 
to the stage. They didn't know what to do with us. The first time someone besides an African-American was going come into a game. So there were some folding chairs by the stage. He said, take a chair and sit on the stage. Well, it's the same stage that the night before Little Richard and Otis Redding had performed on. Wow. Right. And, um, and it was some more game. I, I mean, we can come back to that, but it was, it was an amazing wake up call as to what we were gonna be up against. Hmm. I'm a mom and an outside sales rep. After my second pregnancy, I was left with terrible varicose veins in both legs, a real cosmetic issue for me, until I found Vein Specialist of the South, a five-star experience from consult to procedure. The staff truly cared about my comfort and explained every step in detail. Now my legs feel amazing. I have my youthful legs back. If you want the best, call Vein Specialist of the South today. Tell us, uh, it's hard to believe probably how many years has it been since that state championship season? 54. 54 wow. years. So are, most, are all the players still alive? Um, we, were, we were the first integrated team to win the state championship. We had two African-American players, uh, Clifford Moore and uh, Bulldog, Ronnie Bulldog Nelson, and they're both deceased. And then we had a, a Craig Hertwig that played professional football he was, he was just a big body. He was about 6'9". He didn't get that much playing time, but he took up a lot of space. But yeah. those three are deceased. But everyone else is, is doing well. So share uh, kind of your recollections of that season and yeah. what your expectations were and what sure. Coach expected. Well, we, we, we started, we opened the season against Peter G. Applin, and we opened at the Macon Coliseum, which it was the first event ever in the Macon Coliseum. And it was the first time a African-American basketball team was playing a predominantly white basketball team. So history was made. That was the first athletic wow. event in the Coliseum? First, first event period and first athletic event. Hmm. So was it sold out or what was it? It was nearly sold out. Hmm. Nearly, we probably had 6,000, I don't know how many holes, but it was. What was the atmosphere much, like? <laughs> It was different. It was, it was, it was, it was wild, but you still, you still had the, you know, you had that segregated right, really. fan, yeah. one on one side, one on the other. And, yeah. and, uh, we won that game. And, uh, so and, who was the star on that Appling team? Uh, there were several, there were several, but coach Rory Robinson was a great coach. He was, he was the coach. He was a coach. He was my coach in college. Is that right? Yeah. He was right. a, he was uh, coach Clifton admired him. We, we really, yeah. we really appreciated him because he was, he was open to what we were trying to do yeah. as basketball teams in, in Macon. And uh, we went on to, our season was 20, we, we ended the season 23 and four, and we lost our region game, tournament game, to Carver of Columbus. Hmm. But first and second in the region went to the state. So we weren't too upset, right. I mean, we're going to the state. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and once we get to the state, we advanced, we, we went all of our games all the way up to the final Looking at the championship game, we, we end up winning our semifinal game on a Saturday. Typically, you play a championship game on a Saturday, but because Georgia Tech was using the, the Tech Coliseum for their games, mm -hmm. it pushed the tournament out, and so the final game now is going to be on Monday. Well, mm -hmm. that's never happened before or after. The, the only game, the only sports event going on in Georgia on Monday, March the 10th, 1969, was this basketball game, and four stations were broadcasting it statewide, and it's yeah. estimated that over 400,000 people tuned in and listened to that game. Wow, yeah. wow. Right. Yeah, I can tell you about the game, but it was double overtime, and we were down 71 to 70 with 10 seconds left in the second overtime. All Carver has to do is get the ball in and ice it, but Cam Boniface steals the in, inbound pass, flips it to Frank Prince, gets a quick basket, and we win 72-71 in a double overtime. Wow. And, and to tell you how good Carver was, we only had seven turnovers the entire game. We were 22 of 25 from the free, free throw line. We uh, were, Carver only out-rebounded us by four, and it took two overtimes to beat them by one point. So wow. they were an unbelievable team. You know, the, the amazing thing for me is a lot of times, it, well, it's the players, but it's really the coach. Yeah. Don't you think? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, mean, he instilled in you the ability to think that you could succeed. He prepared you to succeed. And 
you know, he adjusted during the game. And he did. You guys, uh, you have a, y'all have a long lasting friendship with. We do. Coach we do. And, and, and one of the things he did, it, it, this is one of the turning points in the season was that Lanier was our cross town rival. And we were basically a class A school because we didn't have very many students. And they were a triple A. That was the highest classification. They said, if you're not a triple A, we're not going to play you. So we played up. That was the thing. So that, you had to say, okay, we're going to play oh, as yeah. a triple A team. Yeah, we played as a triple A team. And, and we beat Lanier the first game pretty handily. So we didn't take them very seriously. Next game, they beat us. So we were going back for the third game. Well, they beat us at the buzzer the third game. And Coach Clifton comes into the locker. That's at the city auditorium. He comes in the locker. He goes to loosen his tie rips off his neck. He takes a clipboard, flips it across the room, and he says, I can't coach you guys, and he walks out. The next day at practice, he's about 15 minutes late, and then he calls us up and he says, some of you are not going to be starting at the next game against Northside of Warner Robins. And he said, we're going to be doing things my way or the highway. And we won that Northside game, and it brought us together as a team. And he knew what it took to gain authority and get us to listen and do what we needed to do. So the first racially integrated basketball team wins a state championship. What, what was the conversation around town? What were some of the headlines that kind of came away from that? Well, one of the, one of the nice things, surprising things, was that when we returned Tuesday from Atlanta, we hit, there wasn't much 75 paved, and we hit I-16 crossing the river there. And we looked up ahead and there were two fire trucks on each side of the highway and they were shooting water. It was like a, making an archway and there was a police car with lights on it. Coach Clifton said, must have been a bad wreck. You know, and I guess they're going to take us through this wreck. So we go through this, this water arch and the police car exits at Spring Street where we were going to go back to the high school. And I noticed there, there are police cars blocking off the bridge. And we turn and go left and there are thousands of people along the highway without regard to race, standing side by side, that came together as a community to pull for our really? basketball victory. And that was the rewarding thing, what, what perhaps the federal government could not do, mm -hmm. our basketball team did, bringing, making together without regard to race. Wow, wow. Now, I, I, I understand in this documentary, there's someone by the name of Sam Oney, and you touched on him earlier. Can you explain his part in this? Sure, sure. Sam, as I mentioned, Sam came from Africa. That was his home. He, for, for, for 100 years, a missionary group had gone to Africa, and they were looking to bring back converts to get an education, and Sam finally became one. And he came back roomed with the basketball center for Mercy University named Don Baxter. He was the biggest man on campus. He and Don roomed together, and the second day they were in their dorm room after Sam had arrived, the pastor from the church that had gone over and sent the missionary group came over, knocked on the door and said, Sam, we're glad you're here, but we want you to know that you're not going to be welcome at our church. So Don Baxter was planning to go into the ministry, that changed Don's pers perspective. And Don changed his, 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 uh, his, his major to pre-med and became a world-renowned orthopedic surgeon. But Coach Clifton, our coach, was the guard at Mercer at the same time that Don was playing basketball. And he saw things that were happening with Sam Oney and with Don Baxter, with, with bomb scares and with things that that Don lost his, actually lost a girlfriend over rooming with an African from, you know, coming to America to get an education at Mercer. Wow. Because Sam was from Ghana, right? Ghana. That Ghana. Okay. That's correct. That's correct. So, <clears throat> I kind of, is it true that the president of Mercer called Don up and said, you'll be rooming with Sam? Yeah, is that, is that true? Yeah, well, that's true. And Don said, no, I don't think I want to. And then Don started thinking about it. Don had met uh, Martin Luther King Sr. and Jr. a couple of summers prior to that at his church. And Don had a heart to do things that were in the, in the, in the goodwill of mankind. And so Don convinced himself that this is what he should do. And so he, uh, he roomed with, with Sam. Actually, Sam 
didn't have any clothes, hardly. Uh, Don took him down to, to, to Thorpe's, bought him a shirt, bought him a tie, uh, bought him some extra shoes, and they found a church home. I think it was a Vineville Baptist Church where they ended up going to church. And Sam was the first, was the first member of the African-American member of the Southern Baptist Conference here in So where's, where's Sam now? Sam is in Atlanta, Sam's retired, and Sam is in Atlanta. His, 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 I wanted to have Sam here today too, but his health is not as good as it had been in the past. But uh, he is a very gracious and interesting person. And um, he, was, he, was, um, he was treated, I'm sure it was very difficult because he had no idea the hatred that was associated with race when he left Africa with missionaries that were loving and kind and reaching out to him. And then he comes here and he's in the middle of the civil rights movement. So earlier uh, you mentioned Beach High School and Gator Rivers. Uh, there's amazing a story, backstory to this, including Gator's life, but also the coach there. Yep. And the fact that y'all did play Beach High School along the way. Could you tell us, uh, our audience, a little bit more about that? Sure, sure. And just, just to... Just to get Gator on this one, we did win that game in the quarterfinals against Beach in the state tournament, 52-49. Uh, to 49. But, but Beach had won it in 67. They were runners up in 68, so we knew they were good. So they were the first integrated, integrated African-American team, team. to win the state, the all-classification all state classification. championship. All-classification. That was the first year they were allowed, an a, a African-American team was allowed to participate in Georgia High School. So they had their league. And, they had and, their league. It was referred to as a GIA. Right. So they must have had a great coach, too. They had a great coach. And, and Beach had won in their own, in their own uh, league in the GIA. They'd won the state six times. Hmm. And one year they had been ranked number two in the <clears> nation. A great team, and Coach Russell Ellington was was just a a great coach. He's actually in the Georgia Sports Hall of Fame here, and should be. And uh, what uh, what Gator what Gator did a little bit about Gator. Uh, Gator was born in Savannah to a 12 year old mother, and if you think about Gator's success, I mean he had to really overcome a lot. But when he was seven years old, his mother took him to see the Harlem Globetrotters at a theater. And when Gator left the theater, he told his mother, he said, that's what I want to do. <laughs> so on the way home, they passed a pawn shop. Gator asked his mom to buy him a basketball, and it started there. And when uh, Gator, Gator was real talented, and he had developed his skills. And when he was in the seventh grade, Coach Ellington would take him on road trips and when they, the team would be pressing, he'd put Gator in as a seventh grader, and Gator could break, break the press, no problem. But uh, Gator didn't get that much playing time. So in the eighth grade, Gator decided he was going to drop out of school. But he was only, in, he wasn't, that was elementary school. Yeah, yeah, it was ele grade. elementary <laughs> right. school. Technically, yeah, yeah. he should have been playing, but it was <laughs> one of those things that on the road, you know, it wasn't a big deal. But, uh, and uh, it was in the GIA classification, so it didn't matter. But, but um, in the eighth grade, he decided to drop out of school. He was, he was shooting pool at a pool hall, was getting pretty good and making a little money. And Coach Ellington noticed he wasn't in school. So he asked some of the students, said, where's, where's Gator? They said, oh, man, he's dropped out of school. He's, out, he's down at the pool hall. Well, Coach Ellington went straight to his house and told his mom. She didn't know. She didn't know. She didn't know a thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so she didn't believe him. Yeah. So he said, well, I'll stay right here. You go look, and you'll find him. And she walks down there, and she sees him, she takes a pool cue, a pool stick. Gator says she broke it over his behind. And you believe, walked, you believe she did that? I believe she probably You'd did. You'd get in trouble for that today, you wouldn't you? You would, <laughs> would. but she, she, he said she snatched him up, walked home, and was crying and arguing with him the whole way. And when they got there, Coach Ellington was there, and she said, I'm turning him over to the juvenile delinquency agency. And Coach Ellington said, don't do that. He said, let him live with me, and I'll guarantee he graduates from high school. And that's when you think about the difference in the path of Gator's life, and that's where you come up with that saying, a good coach can change a game, but a great coach can change a life. And Coach Ellington was in that category. I, I put Coach Clifton in that category, too, because we, we had some players. Clifford Moore, one of our African-American players, 
lived outside of the bus area. He had two parents that were blind and he had no way to get to school. Coach Clifton wow. picked him up every morning and brought him to school. And um, Clifton wow. wrote Coach Clifton years later. I saw a copy of the letter and said the highlight of his life was being on the team and winning, being on a championship team. So did uh, Gator play in college? Gator went to Western Missouri, became an All-American, and he wanted to play for the Globetrotters. He tried out with 47 other athletes, and Gator made the cut and the others didn't. Uh -huh. And so he played for the Globetrotters for years. Um, one of the interesting stories is um, Gator, the, the Globetrotters came here mm -hmm. to Macon years ago at the, at the Macon Coliseum. And um, Scott Judd, who guarded Gator on the game that we beat him 52-49 and kept Gator from scoring so many points, Scott took his sons to see the Harlem Globetrotters. Afterwards, the, the Globetrotters had a place where you could go get autographs. And, and as Scott was walking up, Gator Rivers saw him, and he pointed to him and said, Scott Judd, Mark Smith, 1969. And I told Scott, I said, that's better than being in the Georgia Sports Hall of Fame. I mean, that is fantastic for Gator Rivers to remember you after all those years. Is there a documentary about Gator's life? There, there is not yet. There is not yet. But um, So he would be included some and in, in have a part of this? Oh, yes, for sure. For sure. And, and he's listed. He, he told about the problems as a Harlem Globetrotter. On, on our website with morethanchampions.net, he talks about how you could perform you could entertain, but you couldn't, you couldn't eat. You had to get on the bus and go on to the next town. And um, there was, you know, segregation, still problems with race when he was a member of the Harlem Group. So, Jack, you've obviously spent a lot of time producing this. There have been a lot of resources that have gone into More Than Champions. If there's one takeaway that you want viewers at home to take from More Than Champions, what do you think that would be? You know, I think back at all the things that were going on in the 60s. It was very, a lot of turmoil. And I, I think you had, you had uh, our president, John F. Kennedy, assassinated in 63, Martin Luther King in 68, Bobby Kennedy two months later. You had the Vietnam War going on. You had, you had uh, riots because of the Civil Rights Movement. And, but there was a way that we came together. As, as, as a family of, of men, and, and race didn't matter to everyone. And it's almost like maybe today someone can say, we can do this again. Mm -hmm. You know, we can get over some of this, these differences that we still have. You know, the, it's, it's not completely gone away. And, uh, uh, but that, that hopefully will, will hit the spot with some people. That's one of the reasons for this documentary, More Than Champions is to uh, present a message of uh, healing, hope, uh, to being together, and uh, how powerful that can be, don't you think? Sure, yep, yep. Jack, can you tell us where people can learn more about this documentary, and what the plan is for when, whenever it comes out? Sure, sure. If, right now, we're trying to raise money for it, but if you go to the morethanchampions.net website and you scroll to the bottom of the page, there's a link to Veritas Mission Films. And if you click that link, then the top of the next page, you can find the word donate. And if you click donate, then you'll see a, a um, icon of two basketball players <clears throat> saying more than champions. Once you click that picture, it takes you to a site where you can donate $25 up to $10,000. And our film company is a 501c3 organization. So donations are tax deductible. And if you make a donation, you'll immediately get an email verifying that you made a tax-deductible donation. So morethanchampions.net, correct? correct? Correct. Wonderful. Now, tell us a little bit more about Veritas Productions. I, I'm personally uh, friends with uh, Kevin McPhee. I think I might have introduced you guys, but tell, tell the folks a little bit about Kevin. Sure. And what he's done in his career and yep, yep. why he's the man. Well, Kevin, Kevin goes back, he's been in the film industry for uh, 40 years and started with Disney. I mean, he has Walt Disney drawings that are signed by Walt Disney. He was hired by the Green family years ago, the Hobby Lobby family, to produce a documentary and a feature film, uh, End of the Spear um, was, was one of them. And they were very successful. Beyond the Gates of Splendor was the other one. 
And uh, Kevin has this, this desire to produce films of faith, family, just mm -hmm. things that, that you don't get to see every day through the normal film industry. So he is committed to making these kinds of films, and he has several. When you go to that Veritas Mission Films, you'll see he, he has several projects he's working on, but uh, More Than Champions is, is one of those. But uh, just a, a great guy, and I know you connected us because he, he and Coach Hoffman were best friends, and right. you and I didn't even know each other. Right. You just knew about the basketball story, and you told right. Kevin, hey, you need to call this guy, and uh, it's so funny. That's the way things start sometimes, That's right? right. That's right. Yep, yep. We have something extra special to kind of end the show with today. Uh, Jack bought the championship jacket from that uh, historic game, and we're gonna we're gonna have him help him don this jacket. I'll Phillips, be the I'll be the master. It's gonna be kind of like the you know, master. To, You'll have to take this to don you with this, and we're gonna put this championship jacket on. And we hope that you guys will help. Uh, Jag and the team and Kevin uh, fund this so we can see this theaters in the future. It still fits. Mark Smith Boys. That's right. It does. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Jag, thanks so much for joining us. Again, it's morethanchampions.net. If people want to view this or if they want to donate to help important causes like this, we really do appreciate it. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And thank, thank you, you guys for joining us. As always, stay tuned for where me and Dr. Harper might show up next. You never know where it might be. I'm a nursing professor, mother of four, and very active, playing in sports my entire life. After each pregnancy, my legs got worse, and I started running again to lose baby weight, but nothing helped how my legs looked. I was self-conscious in a bathing suit or shorts, and my legs ached after sitting or standing too long. That's when I went to vein specialists of the South. The ultrasounds they performed were very thorough, and they explained everything in detail. I knew then I picked the right place for vein care. During my procedures, I was never uncomfortable and they played my favorite praise music the whole time. I can't say enough good things about the staff. I've never been to an office where everyone I came in contact with was smiling and happy to help in every way. I'm very happy with how my legs look now. It's a drastic difference and I have confidence in myself again. If you need vein care, I encourage you to call Vein Specialist of the South today. It's the best choice you'll make.